Hello everyone and welcome back to the only podcast on the internet that can effectively survive the zombie apocalypse. I am Jimbo of Retro Game Lounge on YouTube, that is Tyler of Metroids Primed, and welcome to the Nerd Bucket Podcast. Uh, we're going to do something kind of special this time. Uh, Tyler and I are both big fans of The Walking Dead, and I'm sure a lot of you are out there too. I mean, who really hasn't heard of that show, man? I mean, it's like, that's it's everywhere. And uh, most recently, the uh, Fear the Walking Dead, the kind of spin-off prequel side uh, series uh, premiered on AMC. And we just figured, why not make this kind of like a zombie-themed episode? You know, talk about, do a top five based around zombies. Um, some of your questions were actually kind of based around that. And just have a little bit of fun with it. So, Tyler, how are you doing today, man? I've been meaning to ask you that since I started talking <laughs> 30 seconds ago. Well, Jimbo, I'm not doing too good, man. And let me uh, tell you why. Oh, shit. I, I just got back from GameStop. Okay, enough said. I don't need to hear anymore. <laughs> So I've got a I've got a game slop story here, and um, I wanted to go by and look at the PSP game PS Vita games, and uh, I like to do that from time to time because you can find some like really great games for your Vita uh, for fairly cheap. And I've been looking for uh, the Batman game, Black Batman Blackgate, and Good game. I found it at at GameStop here, and so I go up there and I picked up. Uh, Batman Blackgate, and I picked up uh, Rayman Origins, okay. and took them up to the counter, and the damn guy checking me out, like when I wasn't looking, swaps out my game, and puts it in one of those shitty generic cases, you know? Oh no! And hands it back to me, and <laughs> like I don't understand why they they do this. I like I get my my package, open it up, and I look. And, I mean, he did it on the sly. And I'm looking, I'm like, that's not the case I got. I, you know, I mean, us being collectors, we want a complete inbox, of right? Course, yeah. Yeah. Well, anyways, I, I told the guy, I was like, you know, can I get the the original box for it? You know, I collect. I, I want it to, you know, look good up on the shelf there. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, man, we're we're really not supposed to, to do this, uh, you know, with the with holiday season coming around, they want us to have all the boxes on the shelf and all that. So oh, I was like, off. yeah, don't throw that, them away, asshole. How about it, that? Well, that, that kind of touches on another story I have. But anyways, I've, I told the guys like, look, I was like, either, you know, I'd get the box or you can take it back because, you know, I'm not going to, to buy a game in a generic case or whatever. Right. I mean, at least give us the damn case. I mean, Vita games don't even have manuals. Right. You know, we need we need at least a case. So anyway, so the guy was like, "Well, I guess uh, I'll let you do it, but but we're really not supposed to." Oh, well, please. let's rewind like two weeks ago. You know, me and you were talking about Zombie U and that sell that they were having for it. Right. And. Um, we weren't able to get it on Best Buy, right. and we weren't able to get it on Walmart or whatever. Dot com. They were having like a really good sale, it was like ten bucks, brand new or something like that. Seven dollars, brand new. Yeah, seven dollars. Well, anyways, I, I stopped by the exact same GameStop to pick up a copy of it, and I want to say it was like maybe ten bucks or something like that um, used. And I take the box up to the counter mm -hmm. and. A different guy's checking me out this time. He goes and he like pulls a box from the um, little behind the counter area, I guess, where they keep all the used games. Right. Well, anyway, so he pulls it out and there's no game in there, and he's like, "What the hell?" You know, I guess somebody had traded in a game that didn't have a game in it, and they accepted it. And so he was like, "Well, there's no game in it." He just throws it in the trash. I mean, we're talking about a, and of course, it's, of course, it is a Wii U game box. But I mean, you can sell those online for eight to ten dollars for a lot of people that you know just have the CD that want to have a complete game. I know people do it all the time online. Just, just so and, we know, and most of our viewers can't see it right now, but I've got like a total look of what the fuck on my face right now. So, uh, to all the viewers uh, right now, just imagine me with that kind of like, what, what the hell kind of face but anyway so i'm sorry continue but anyway so he just throws it in the garbage and i'm just like shaking my head but I'm like 
that's why I think GameStop is doomed to fail. Uh You have two separate instances. They want the game box. Right. But why in the hell are you throwing the game boxes away? Like, perfectly good game box that could be for display or, Mm -hmm. or hell, I mean, you can put them up in the store, empty game cases, you know, for sale, for cheap. You could at least get some money. But I don't understand their policy of just throwing the boxes away. I don't it either. makes no sense to me, they, and and I know they do it by oh, you know the the trash bags full because there's a lot of YouTubers out there that that go dumpster diving at um behind you know their local GameStop right and um you know get all kinds of really cool stuff that they just throw away right. But, no, it's horrible. I've, I've always wondered that exact same thing myself. Like, why would they do this? And it's the way it's been explained to me is it's a simple storage problem. Like, the stores of GameStop are really, really small. Um, if they were something akin to, like, Best Buy or Walmart, where they had a little bit more storage space, this probably would be a non-issue. But they're basically built like McDonald's. They're almost, like, modular. And space is always going to be a problem for them. But, no, I agree with you. I mean, like, take the cases, put them in a bin, and sell them for, like, two bucks. You know? Or... I mean, you know they have like centralized distributing places right where i know they have places in like alabama and louisiana i think that do a lot of the retro right um refitting and stuff for the old systems like right. send them there as storage or something to hold on to i mean they've got these places where they supposedly you know have all these retro games like they were holding on to the Wii Metroid trilogies, which we know were were just remanufactured, right? You know that whole shady thing with them. But I I don't know. I, I just don't understand GameStop. They're so shady with their games, and you know, I mean, they throw away stuff that is perfectly you know good money. But I, I just think that's why they're doomed to fail. I completely agree. I don't remember the last time I gave them my money. So fuck GameStop. I'll go on record saying that. <laughs> Oh, brother. But yeah, they, they've got me fired up today, buddy. Uh, yeah, I see that. Bearded Wonder has got a story. We don't, we aren't often <laughs> graced with such drama in the life of Tyler, man. That's awesome. But what have you been up to, buddy? Oh, buddy. Um, I had kind of an interesting weekend uh, for, for several reasons. Um, number one, uh, Saturday was my birthday, uh, for those of you who are not in the know. and um, Happy birthday to uh, you, buddy. <laughs> thanks, Tyler. Um, I normally keep my birthdays pretty low key. I'm a pretty chill guy. And, um, I just had some basic things to do that day and just kind of enjoyed not having work, not having YouTube, which is work uh, for any of you who've done it. It's, it's a lot of work actually. And just kind of took a day for myself, you know, played some games, just, you know, screwed off for the whole day and just enjoyed not having any responsibilities. So I was sitting out on my front porch, uh, later on that night, enjoying a birthday cigar and um, I happened to notice something odd that happened uh, basically, I guess, right in front of me. Um, so I see this car, a late model Civic, uh, coming down the street. And it almost looks like they're looking for a house. I live in a townhouse division. And it, you see this kind of thing all the time. Like, people don't know where they're going. And they're, like, you know, looking on both sides, trying to find the house. I'm like, ah, they're probably just lost. So they stop. And then they put it in reverse and start backing up the street. And I'm like, okay. And then I hear this loud boom. And they freaking smash into a parked car, uh, the, the truck belonging to my neighbor, three doors down. Oh, wow. Like, oh, shit. So I just think, like, all right, he's probably going to go, you know, get out and uh, knock on the door and be like, hey, it's your truck. And that's not what happened. Um, this dude, like, backs out of the freaking bumper kiss that he gave this thing and tries to take off. As in, like, freaking hit and run kind of shit. Nice. And I see him doing that, and I freaking ran out in the middle of the street and got in front of the car, and I was like, hey, pull the fuck over, and waved him over to the side. And he was a little bit hesitant at first. I'm like, boom, and I pull out my phone. I'm like, pull over, just to let him know I'm serious. And uh, basically, we were at a bit of an impasse as uh, we were kind of working with a little bit of a language barrier on this one. Uh, so I was basically trying to explain to them, you need to go knock on that dude's door and tell him what happened. You know, accidents happen, but hit and run's illegal. Uh, so they were a bit, little bit hesitant about that, and without boring you guys with details, it ended up with me calling the police. Um, so did my civic duty, uh, reported a hit and run, and um, I, I don't know the outcome of this. I just uh, I hope the owner's gotten some restitution because, I mean, he had like a cracked taillight, and they definitely traded paint. You know, it was a white truck. You could see like blue streaks on it, so... 
I just couldn't believe that shit. I don't know if these guys were drunk or whatever, but I was like, oh, man. It's like, come on. Like, really? So, yeah, did my did my civic duty on my uh, day celebrating one more year around the sun. So, go America. Hooray. Well, that was a, that was a pretty exciting end to a birthday, right? <laughs> I guess. It's like, really? <laughs> Does this have to happen today? Oh, and here's the funny part. <clears throat> Excuse me, folks. I need some water. Um... The uh, the cop actually, when he was getting my information, he was taking my statement, you know, my name and phone number and stuff. He was asking me for my date of birth. I was like, uh, today. And he was like, today's your birthday? I was like, yeah. And he was like, he's like, man, I'm sorry. You're having to deal with this on your birthday, but <laughs> it, happy birthday, sir. I was like, thank you, man. That's really nice. The cop was really awesome. Like, no no bad drama, no nothing experience. Very professional. Um, did his job, and I actually didn't know this. Um, you told me that in my state of Virginia, you actually have 24 hours to report an accident before it's declared hit and run. I didn't know that. I figured okay. that it had to be almost immediately, but uh, oh well. So yay, exciting for me, but I'm sure you guys uh, want to hear more about game shit because this is the nerd bucket, and we kind of, well, your story was kind of nerdy. Mine was like domestic <laughs> dispute, but um, what games have we been playing this week, Tyler? I want you to go first on this one. All right, so uh, this past week I actually finished up uh, DC versus Marvel Universe, and uh, it was it was pretty good. It wasn't as good as Injustice, like okay. I was saying before. Um, doesn't have like the cool super moves that Injustice did. Um, like Batman's a badass, but like I I went through so many scenarios. Like they continually are swapping up who you're fighting with throughout the entire story. Right. And you, like, will get somebody that's, like, really fun to play with, like Batman or um, Superman, a couple other the DC characters. And then you'll go through, like, Shazam wasn't that fun. Um, and a few other, uh, Wonder Woman wasn't that fun to me either. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It just it, it had, like, high points and low points and kind of kept flip-flopping. And um, the Mortal Kombat side of the game was really fun mm -hmm. uh, i enjoyed playing as those characters awesome uh they seemed a lot more powerful than the dc characters i don't i don't know why that was <laughs> yeah you, you you would think it'd be more balanced but um i finished zombie u so um I, awesome i had to really you know push <laughs> it I, I was slow at work this past week so i was able to really like put a lot of effort into that so i finished that Okay. Um, I played a little bit of Tearaway, which is a great game on the Vita. Um, it's made by the same people who... Um, oh, crap. I can't even think of the name of the game. What's the cute little sack boy? I don't know why it's... Little Big Planet. Little Big Planet. I don't know why it, it dropped out of my mind there, but they, they made that game, and it's so unique. Mm -hmm. uh, you play as like this little letter... And you're trying to, like, the letter in the game that you're controlling is trying to be delivered to me. And, like, it's such a unique use of the Vita. You can, like, the back part of the Vita that actually has, like, the touch controls, like, if you touch it in the on the back of the game, uh, back of the game console, mm -hmm. like, your finger pops up in certain areas huh. in the game. Like, you design, like, certain things. Like, I designed, like, a snowflake the other day, and, like, snowflakes are dropping, and it's the exact thing that I designed wow. out of paper. Um, like, during the game, like, you're looking down on the world. Like, it'll look up at the sun, the little character will, and you'll be, like, looking at it, and you'll be, like, waving at it and stuff. I mean, it, it makes you wow. interact with the character. It's so immersive. Uh, such a neat game, the... I mean, if you played Little Big Planet, you know what I'm talking about. These, they make just really unique games. Right. Um, but uh, that's really fun. And I've been playing a little bit of Mario 64, but that's about it. Gotcha. That's cool. Um, I've been still up to Far Cry 4 shenanigans, just playing co-op because that's such a freaking massive game. I've been uh, hunting down the masks and other uh, chests and things, just flying around in a helicopter trying to get all the collectibles and things. Uh, but I actually have recently restarted playing a game I completed a long time ago on the Xbox 360, a very early release for that system. That would be Mercenaries 2 World in Flames. And that game is one of the best co-op games I've ever played in my life. It is so much fun, and it's so silly. Like, it's like a sillier GTA with way cooler shit. You know, instead of just drive-bys, excuse me, and um, 
you know, uh, fun with cars and motorcycles, stuff like that. You have, like, uh, airstrikes and nuclear bombs and shit you can drop. It's just so ridiculously over the top and just so silly, you know, calling in uh, drops for supplies and everything like that. And it's just kind of reawakened my love for that game. I'm just kind of sad they took down some of the DLC. Um, I want to be able to run around in the chicken suit. I don't know why they removed that, but the chicken suit was awesome. So that's uh, about all I've been playing this week. I got I did get a stack of new games for my birthday, so I, I definitely will have a lot more to report on the next podcast. I got a lot of AAA titles I'm looking forward to cracking open and taking a look, one of which is Rare Replay. Um, so I'm sure... That's what I'm talking about. I'm sure the next time we pod, we'll have uh, some Conquer stories, you know, playing nice. games and stuff like that. So looking forward to it. Um, pre-order Gears of War. Uh, definitely looking forward to checking out a huge Gears of War fan. Yeah, I need to get that new uh, Gears of War pre-ordered. When does it come out? Tuesday. Tuesday, tomorrow. okay. As in well, shit. <laughs> well, I need to order it then, I guess. Well, tomorrow, because this is Monday. I'm sure you guys are hearing this on Wednesday. Actually, but... I, I might actually already have it pre-ordered. I know I wanted it back when they announced it, and I remember pre-ordering the Rare Replay, so I might actually already have it pre-ordered. I'm looking forward to playing it again. Yeah, for real. So as anyone who watches or listens to our podcast knows, Tyler and I are both huge fans of top five lists. It's a really fun thing to do. Anyone can do it. And it gives us a chance to kind of let you guys into our world a little bit and let you know what we think about particular genres. Uh, As I mentioned earlier, this is kind of a zombie theme episode. And we figured what better way uh, to do an episode of the friggin' Nerd Bucket podcast than to do a top five zombie themed video games of all time. Uh, So Tyler and I will go through our lists. Uh, We'll just kind of take turns throwing the ball back and forth, uh, starting with number five and working our way back up to one. Uh, If it's all right with you, buddy, I'll kick it off. Go ahead, man. All right, cool. Excuse me. Um, So with number five, uh, and I'll be honest with you guys, it was really tough for me um, to narrow this down to five instead of six. I had one that I really wanted to include in this list, but, excuse me, um, there can really only be five, so I'm going to put that one as an honorable mention, which will be revealed at the end of this list. So for my number five, I'm going to do the game that I felt really kicked the Xbox 360 into high gear. This was a release relatively early on um, in the the Xbox 360's lifespan, um, if I remember correctly, right around 2006, and the Xbox 360 came out in 2005, and that would be Dead Rising, uh, mainly because it really pushed the the capabilities of what you know people thought was possible with the Xbox 360 at that moment meaning uh, with the number of zombies that you could see on screen and whatnot like I mean the the processor and the memory and uh, the video card were definitely getting a workout anytime you put in this game and just the simple fact that you know instead of just a handful of enemies uh, to fight at any given time I mean you were literally fighting fucking oceans of these things all at once you could just you know get up a freaking a stick or a sword or something and just cut these people down like mowing a lawn of flesh I mean it was absolutely awesome there was nothing else like it at the time and it was more or less the video game version of Dawn of the Dead even though they had to make for legal reasons there's a disclaimer on the front of the box saying that it's not in any way connected to or a sequel to or anything like that related to uh, to George Romero's Dawn of the Dead but that for me is a very very solid number five um, just as an FYI uh, Dead Rising 2 and Dead Rising 3 I have played but have not completed, so I felt I needed to include the original one on this list, so I'll leave it at that. But I'll turn it over to Tyler. Tyler, sir, what is your number five? All right, for number five, I have Half-Life 2. Um, that's one of my favorite games of all time, and some people might not consider Half-Life 2 a zombie game, but definitely had uh, a lot of zombie aspects to it. Um, the guys with the head crabs were honestly some of the freakiest like encounters of a monster in a game i mean coming at you with that big thing on their head and and just I, man i i used to hate coming in contact with those in half-life 2 mm-hmm. um, but i was first introduced to half-life 2 back in one of the greatest games that was ever released and that's the orange box oh yeah and um it's been a favorite of mine ever since. I had to include that at number five. That's a good number five. And good plug for the orange box, man. Definitely a solid value for the Xbox 360. 
Okay, so for my number four, um, I actually picked uh, Dead Rising 2 Riptide. Um, I am a fan of the original Dead Rising, um, but I did kind of like the change of scenery um, on in this particular game because you weren't basically stuck specifically in a resort. It kind of branched out a little bit. Um, you got to go to, to different parts of the island and whatnot. Um, and just, I, I don't know, it just for me it was a little bit a little bit nice of a change of pace. It had pretty much everything that you um, that you had in, in the first game. I mean, I almost wouldn't even call it a sequel because it was almost like a, just an extra episode. You know, I mean, they didn't really change anything. The game engine was the exact same. The fighting engine was the same. The system was the same. Uh, that the weapon crafting system, all of that was the same. This was just basically a different location. So, while it is technically a sequel, um, I think the main reason that I included this on this list, and I'm really pissed that we didn't get this in the United States, there was a lot of controversy surrounding this when this game came out, um, with the special edition box set that came out, um, I believe, in Europe. Uh, it basically had this box with this bust of a statue with a, I, I guess, like a zombie female's torso like in a bikini and like head was cut off one of the arms was cut off and stuff and you know, people were so up in arms like oh god this is horrible you know they're showing like you know violence towards women and blah 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 blah, blah. okay that's neither here nor there i just thought it was a really cool bus and i'm like really they're putting that over there but we don't get it here come on now like they have the restrictions on that <laughs> shit we don't you know we get everything here that's why it's awesome to be in america but uh that for me is a very solid number four i mean it's just it's so much fun, you know, if nothing else, the co-op experience. you got four four player drop-in, drop-out co-op, just on the fly, right when you want to do it. And it's so ridiculous um, in the fact that there's almost no guns in the game. Like, guns and ammo are very few and far between. It's ma mainly melee weapons. And it's just so fun to kind of roam around with your buddies like a roving gang and just assault the undead, basically. Like, literally, like, beat them and cut them to death. And it's... It, it's I don't know why it just makes me giggle like every time I think about it. There's so many uh, so many fun nights playing that with some of my buddies. But Tyler, you're number four, sir. All right, number four for me is a game that me and you had a lot of fun playing a couple years ago. What's up? And to me, is one of the best co-op games of all time, and that's the original Left for Dead. And you know, I, I had so much fun going through all the different missions, and especially like right at the end of the the level on each of them, when the horde of zombies start to come, and yep. you know you've got limited amount of time to to get where you're going before you get left, and um, all of the special zombies that you encounter mm -hmm. in that game just really take the game to another level, um, but. That game is great by itself, but it's so much more fun when you're playing with your friends. Oh, absolutely. And I thought that was a good, good number four. I completely agree. That's, in my opinion, one of the greatest co-op games of all time. Um, that would, If we ever do a co-op list, that's definitely going to be in my top five. Okie doke. So, moving right along to number trace. Um, I could not do a list of zombie games uh, without including a entry from this particular franchise that more or less kicked off the zombie horror franchise like this is pretty much the one that got things going um i'm gonna pick resident evil 2 for my solid number three mainly because i feel that it's more of a zombie game than the original game um in the original game yeah there are zombies in it but you're trapped in a house and there's other monsters and stuff like that i felt in number two the zombies were more of the focal point um you know there was other things there's other monsters like the dude with the tongue and all this other shit but um it, it was more in your face, I guess, like right from the get-go when you start on the campaign, you're on the street, the shit has gone down, Raccoon City's been taken over, and like you're in the shit and the zombies are everywhere, you know, I mean, it's like ground zero of the zombie apocalypse. Um, that one I felt w was what put uh, put Resident Evil 2 head and shoulders above the first game. It just upped the action just a little bit and upped the, the scare factor a little bit. Less claustrophobic because you have more room to move, but in my opinion, more of a worthy entry um, in a zombie franchise game. But turning over to you, what is your number three? All right, number three for me, and if I had to do this game just, or this list, like, specifically ranked on Scare Factor and, and how freaked out I got playing it, this game will be up there close to the top. But um, just as a whole, um, I've got Dead Space as number three. And 
it's not zombies in the traditional sense, but it's definitely undead, kind of morphed into a zombie type creature. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's nothing scarier than a fast moving zombie. And this game has that in spades. And just freak out, you know, left and right. Stuff coming through vents at you. You hear something, you look over, you don't see anything, and something's like right there on the other side of you. And um, I don't know. This game reminds me so much of Event Horizon. And that's one of my favorite sci fi horror uh, movies of all time. Good movie. And, um, you know, I mean, it just had such an original um, idea for a video game. I know, you know, the movie was kind of a different animal from Vent Horizon was, but mm-hmm. uh, I love Dead Space. I, th- I felt that was a solid number three for me. Awesome. Well, uh, moving right along to number two, um, it was pretty tough for me uh, to distinguish number two and number one. I battled on this for actually for a little while, deciding which one was going to be number one and which one was going to be number two. Uh, but I figured in the end, number one was the more worthy Um, overall game but number two a very solid number two even though technically it is not a standalone game it is a mode inside of a game but i feel that this is noteworthy enough uh, that it deserves a spot on the list and that would be call of duty black ops nazi zombies mode um, which was the follow-up from treyarch uh, for their wildly successful uh, world at war uh, game mode for nazi zombies which originally just started out as one single map and it was just kind of an afterthought to the game and they never thought that anything would come of it. You know, it was just kind of like a little goofy thing to play. And uh, for anyone who's played it, the original four characters are not in the... Or the, the four characters that we've come to know and love, you know, Tank Dempsey, Nikolai, Takio, and Dr. Richthofen, are not in the first uh, two uh, maps for, for Call of Duty Nazi Zombies, not in World of War. It kind of evolved out of that because after they released that, they the Brainiacs at Treyarch were noticing that over half of the people that were playing Call of Duty World at War online were playing Nazi Zombies, which was far more than they ever expected. Um, They were expecting sub-5% of people ever to do this, but it became so wildly popular that they actually created downloadable content for this. Like, they built it from the ground up, had no plans on doing this. This was long before any of this part and parcel DLC crap that we're used to now, where it's already on the disc, and they're just paying, they're asking you to pay twice for something you already own. This was totally after the fact, and it just got better and better and better every time they would come out with a new pack. And Black Ops, the follow-up to that, did not disappoint, man. They really freaking brought it on that one. It's the same four characters, and the, the beginning level that you start on, start on Kino de Toten, was supposed to be the fifth DLC for World at War that apparently they just didn't have time to include. So they, being the cool dudes that they are, included that as the first map. They released follow-ups where you're going into space, you're going into Russia and all these other things, and I just felt it was head and shoulders above the original World at War, if nothing else for one specific reason. There was the, I think it was called the Flashback Map Pack, where you got the original four maps for World at War. So you could basically play the entire Nazi Zombies maps from World at War and from Black Ops in the same game. So basically, if you have Black Ops, you've got the whole thing, which I thought was absolutely awesome. Um, I'm glad to see that Treyarch is doing it once again in the next Call of Duty. They're bringing back Zombies mode. That is the only fucking reason I will buy a Call of Duty game. I will buy it just to play that game. And for God's sakes, Treyarch, why are you not making a standalone Zombies game? Seriously, man. Like, this is so popular. Why the fuck aren't they doing that? That would sell... I mean, is it just me, Tyler, or would that fucking sell like hotcakes? I'd buy that in a heartbeat. Like, actually... Oh, yeah, that was huge when that came out. Make it a campaign. Like, you know, like, still have the survival thing, you know, still make it Nazi zombies, but, like, give it a, you know, it's, we've already got characters, give it a story and a campaign. Like, how hard would that be? Well, I mean, you know, you would think with the popularity of Walking Dead and other zombie properties that that would be a no-brainer, you know, I don't know why they're not doing that, but Treyarch, if you're listening, guys, fuck you, take my money. I, I, I will pay you hand over fist to play a standalone game. Anyways, back over to Tyler, number two, sir. All right, um, I don't, I don't think I can really add much more that you haven't already said. Um, my number two is Resident Evil Two, and I had to choose one game from the entire series, and you know, I've, I've talked about it before. Code Veronica really has like a special place in my heart because that was my introduction to the series. But I know deep down that 
that two is a better game. Yeah. I love both of them, but if I had to choose one to put in a list, you know, I'd, I'd have to put Resident Evil Two up there. Um, great game. Yeah. I mean, you've already pretty much said everything there is to say about that. Code so, is uh, awesome, but two is just it's yeah. a better game. It just is a better game. You, you know, I've never played. Uh, there was a Code Veronica X, and I think they added a lot of stuff to the game for. They did. I want to say it was PS2. It is. I own it. They had they okay. a few little things here and there, just a couple of extra flesh out things. But I mean, if you played Code Veronica, you basically played the game. Okay. But, but if you ever wanted to go back and play through it, play play X. I just I remember um, when they had the official Dreamcast magazine, right? And I believe. Code Veronica was first released on the Dreamcast. It was. And um, it, like, just looking at the previews for it and all that, like, we were so looking forward to when that game came out. And they just had screenshot after screenshot of, you know, the blood and the gore and all that and the zombies. And, I mean, Resident Evil is the premier zombie franchise out oh, there. Of course. I mean, no I'm, I'm excited that. about the the remake of of two, the the green lit. Absolutely, and we just learned today they're actually going to be uh, remastering Resident Evil Zero, um, which I felt is a very underappreciated entry in the franchise. I mean, it's the only prequel, uh, basically, in the whole thing. And if you haven't played it on GameCube, guys, please check it out. If you like the Resident Evil remake. Uh, that they did on GameCube, that same crew did Resident Evil Zero, and it's a completely standalone story. It takes place before the events of the first game, and you, you really got to check it out. The first game will make a lot more sense uh, when you when you check that out. It's the whole Rebecca Chambers backstory. Okay, so my number one. Okay, so uh, it was originally going to be the first entry in this particular franchise, but. I just couldn't bring myself to do that as I felt the second one was a much better game uh, for several reasons, and that would be Left 4 Dead 2. Um, mainly because it had everything that the first game had, but it just upped the stakes. Uh, meaning you got melee weapons, which you did not originally have in the first game. Um, they gave you a little bit more of a variety of the weapons, just a little bit. Like instead of just one pistol, there was two. Um, a little bit more variety with rifles and shotguns and etc. And the big thing that I think puts this above the first one is, much like um, Black Ops uh, with the flashback map pack, you can download the map pack for Left 4 Dead 2 that gives you every single map from the first game. And you can play it on the revised engine with the melee weapons, with the new guns, with the new uh, special zombies and everything like that. So it's basically just the first game director's cut version. Which, I mean, to me, that's like, why would you play the first game if you can play this, which is like the better version? You know, it's the exact same game, just with all the extra shit added in. And I've been going back and playing it, and, I mean, just the DLC alone for this. First of all, bless you, Valve, for always releasing DLC for very, very cheap. Um, every time they put out a map pack for this, it was always just a few dollars. Like, I don't think they put one out for this that was more than ten bucks. I think all of them were less than ten dollars. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the biggest thing that they did was the Coldstream DLC, which was entirely fan created. Uh, Valve did not create this. Valve, uh, much like Bethesda, are big fans of the modding community, and they always put their kit out there. So if anyone wants to create maps and whatnot for it, they can. And people went crazy for the Left 4 Dead franchise. Like one guy built an entire Dawn of the Dead um, campaign that like perfectly mimics the movie. Like the the mod community for this is fucking insane. And Coldstream was actually created by a modder. And it's, when you play it, it almost doesn't seem like it's a modder. It seems like Valve themselves did it because the quality control and it's good. It's not really buggy. And they up the ante. Like, instead of, like Tyra was mentioning, at the end of every episode, you've got like the big climactic moment where you've got the shootout where you're in the house waiting for the boat to show up or for the car to come get you. With this one, at the end of every single segment, there's one of those. So, you know, instead of just one big thing at the end if the if the campaign is four chapters you've got four of those things and one big thing at the end so i just felt it it took that that whole formula and ran with it and it made it that much more interesting and considering it was not made by a professional game developer that's one of the best campaigns i've ever played so left for dead 2 in my opinion the greatest zombie game ever made period i like it i like that choice thanks buddy all right, for my number one, I picked a game that actually hadn't been out, but just two or three years now. 
And that is The Last of Us. And Never played this one, a, just as an FYI, folks, but I am looking forward to checking it out. Yeah, I, me and Jimbo were actually talking about this today, and I was just kind of trying to explain it to him a little bit, like what it was all about. But um, this is seriously one of the best survival horror games I've ever played. Um, the zombies in this game aren't your typical zombies i know that's kind of a running theme on my list is you know they're kind of different forms of zombies but these zombies are actually infected by a fungus and they're almost kind of like a form of of like plant zombies like they have growths and stuff coming out of them but um there's a really um specific one that you run from a lot in this game and like basically if they catch up to you it's a kill unless you have uh, like a shiv or something on you, and you have to hit a button like right when they grab you or they'll kill you. Mm. Um, but, I mean, this game had so many ups and downs, and it's a really a touching story about um, this man trying to get this girl like kind of across America. And I don't really want to spoil the game for Jimbo or anybody else that haven't played it, but uh, kind of a surprise twist ending to it. And uh, a great zombie game. Um, it's it's one of my favorite series out there, even though it's just one game. I'm assuming that Naughty Dog is going to come out with a sequel to it. I don't know why they wouldn't. Such a great game like this. But um, that is my number one. So if you look at both of our lists, I guess you could you can see the stark contrast of, like, I went for, like, the more traditional route of, like, the old school, like, very clear-cut, you know, Walking Dead kind of thing well i guess you could give me a little bit of a stretch with left for dead because they're with them it's more like rabies but um just more more the traditional like zombies are people they're just either fast or slow either like the romero version or the 28 days later version like every single entry on my list has one of those two um because to me that to me that's what makes a zombie game like it's it's a very very clearly defined thing but i like the way you think man just like thinking outside the box you know like what exactly is a zombie and um, you've definitely sold me on, on Last of Us. Um, I definitely am looking forward to playing that. It's just, uh, I am I guess I'm holding out. I want to play it on the PS4. So when I do get around to buying one, at the very least, you know, I get to play the best version of it, you know, available. Like the best frame rate, the best graphics, um, all the DLC and everything, you know, just all in one package. So I will definitely check that out. Um, what do you think about, I know a lot of um, different companies are doing this now, but they're, with like the special edition boxes for systems like the PS4, they have a Last of Us edition. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about them actually boxing the games with it um, digital? Because I know a lot of companies are like preloading the games on yeah. there. Or they and do I know that's code or something. Right, and I think that's what they do with the Last of Us edition of um, it's... the Last of Us kind of a catch-22 with me man because like a you know i much like you or most people i'm not made of money and the bundled editions are always cheaper i mean it basically comes down to you getting the game for free um so that's definitely a bonus you know you're saving 50 60 bucks on it which is kind of nice but the collector in me is like i want the hard copy you know it's yeah. and and i've run into this with several of my system purchases with my wii u you know i have the wind waker edition so i don't have a physical copy of that um, with my Xbox One, um, I don't have a physical copy of Assassin's Creed Unity. Uh, with my DS, I don't have a physical copy of Link uh, to the or not Link to the Past, um, Link Between Worlds. You know, all those things are digital, so that that does kind of irritate me. I don't think you're missing anything on Assassin's Creed Unity. I know, but it's <laughs> uh, you know, it's like I, I, know. I paid for it. Can I at least have a copy? But the upside is right. that game is probably so cheap I'll be able to get it for like five bucks at one point. So that's no big deal. But no, I'm I'm with you on that. It's I, I can understand both sides of it. You know, for those people out there who don't have a lot of money, getting a free game, you know, getting basically what the twenty first century equivalent of a pack in game is definitely a bonus. You know, it gets people in the door, it gets you a bigger user base if you throw them a bone. Because if you remember for a while, dude, that kind of went by the wayside. Like this whole idea of a pack in game has been resurrected because for the better part of a decade that was gone. You know, the Xbox and Xbox 360, the, X, the 360 didn't really start doing that to, until the end of its lifespan. Like, for the first five, six years, man, there were no bundles. It was just the fucking system. That was it. So, mm -hmm. on the one hand, you know, hey, Super Mario Bros. Duck Hunt, greatest packing game ever. You know, yeah, that's freaking epic. But at the same time, I'm a physical copy guy, and I always will be. So, 
I am too, and I, I experienced that same thing when I got my Wii U. Um, I got the Deluxe um, 3D World Edition, and it came didn't even come with the digital codes because what I was going to do when I sold my um, well, when I got my Wii U, I was going to sell my digital codes mm-hmm. on eBay for Nintendo Land and Super Mario 3D World, but I got it and I looked, started looking at the box. And I'm like, shit, they're preloaded onto the system, mm-hmm. so I couldn't even do that. So I'm gonna be stuck buying the physical copies, anyways. I guess you are of those two games. But um, one cool thing for you when you actually do buy Wind Waker HD mm-hmm. is there is a beautiful um, collector's edition of that uh, on. You can get it on eBay or whatever, but it was GameStop exclusive that actually comes with a figurine of uh, Ganondorf or whatever he's called in that game. Um, I'm assuming. Okay, so it changes in some games what what his name is, but um, that, in my opinion, since you mentioned that the the Wind Waker edition, that is probably one of the very few special versions of a system with a quote unquote packing game that I felt was worth it. Like it wasn't just a game and a shiny box and everything like that. Like the freaking game pad is like ornate with Hyrulean text all over it and things like that. And the same thing with my DS since I got the gold DS with the Triforce logo and everything. You know, the Microsoft and Sony don't do that as much. Like Microsoft does a little bit with like the the upcoming Halo Five edition of the X Bone. Um, but Nintendo is kind of one of the few groups that's that's still holding that torch. Um, that's still doing the you know the special edition, which is more than just a packing game. You get a completely different system and everything. And for the record, folks, my gamepad was immediately from day one put in a clear plastic acrylic case. So there's never been a single fingerprint on it. And that's the <laughs> way it's going to remain. Um, my DS, same thing. You know, it's got a protective case around it and everything. So um, it is kind of cool to get that. And that does, I, I guess, soften the blow of not having the the actual physical copy. It's like, well, I don't have the physical copy, but I've got like the badass version of the system, and to me, that's more important because uh, that's a lot harder to replace. Quite frankly, and it's going to be a little bit more costly down the road. The games, dime a dozen. You know, you can always get the games, so no big deal. Well, even now, and you could have a special edition that doesn't even come with a game, and that's I've got my Majora's Mask special edition over there, and it did not even come with a digital version of Majora's Mask. What the fuck was the point then? Just to have a system with Majora's Mask uh, graphics on it. I mean, it's a beautiful system. It's probably the nicest 3DS that you can get, but it does not come with the game at all. It's just the wow. system. And I, you know, I was thinking I was going to do the exact same thing with that that I was going to do with my um, Wii U, but it didn't even. I, I assumed that it came with it. You know, I was like you. I thought that that it came with Majora's Mask, but nope, didn't even come with Majora's Mask. You have to buy it separately. That's terrible. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry to hear that, dude. And that's actually a um, a game that um, I, I really think that is what brought me back to the Zelda franchise. Like, I'd, I have a hard time playing some of the newer ones, like um, Wind Waker. I, that's one that I still haven't beaten yet but um that really has made me want to go back i I think the next zelda that i'm gonna try and go back and play is the minish cap Mm -hmm. on game boy advance Mm -hmm. and it's gonna be so much easier to do that now that i have the retron 5 oh yeah i'm I'm just gonna pop that in and and play it on my tv just for it man i mean i don't have a um a 3ds right now i mean not 3ds but a um game boy advance yeah, Game Boy Advance. Like, SP is what I, I generally would like to play it on, but uh, I want to get one of those old-school, like, retro Nintendo-looking ones. Just don't buy it from special GameStop. special edition one. What? Just don't, don't buy it because that was the game no, exclusive. Don't give them your money, folks. Please don't. No, I, if, I, if I do it... Wait, are you talking about the 3DS? Yeah. No, no, no. I, I've got the Majora's Mask 3DS. I'm talking okay. about the Game Boy Advance SP. SP. Oh, I know which one you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go. That's a good one. And um, if I've got one of these, and you can play Game Boy Advance games on it, but the battery life is kind of low on it. And it's the micro, the Game Boy Micros, Advanced Micros. And that's a really good system to play 
Game Boy Advance games on. I'm like you, dude. I'd rather play it on the Retron. I mean, like, why... I mean, unless you're on the go and you're on vacation or something like that, dude, who cares? So sit down in front of your yeah. television and play it on the big screen. You know, well, a lot of times stuff, I can so. play, I can play like during a break or whatever at work. Sure. And sometimes I'm like at work kind of late at night and stuff, and I'm just trying to pass the time. And, you know, that definitely helps some. But I'm, I'm wanting to just play it on the Retron, honestly. I'm with you, man. Want to get into some game news? Well, I, I thought maybe um, since we just did our top five zombie games, you want to go ahead and talk about the um, Fear of the Walking Dead? Sure. Oh, yeah, shit. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, Corey, Mr. Stover, a.k.a. C. Stove on YouTube, had uh, put out a post on a forum that both of both Howard and I called Game Central were asking uh, what everyone thought because apparently it's getting mixed reviews. Like, it's kind of a love hate type of thing. And uh, Corey, if you're listening slash watching, uh, had asked me, you know, what I thought about it. And I'm like, well, bro, we're going to talk about this on the podcast. So if I tell you on Facebook, you'd have no reason to watch it. So, <laughs> uh, Corey, I hope, I hope you're last, I hope you're listening. hope you're watching, buddy. Man, I'm a word here. We're going to cover this shit. Okay, so as far as what I thought about it. All right. Um, I think a lot of people hating on this, this is just my two cents, were expecting The Walking Dead walking into this um and even though the name walking dead is right there in the title um they i don't think they really had any illusions about what this show was really about i mean basically this is about the very beginning of the zombie apocalypse like how this would actually unfold in real life and from that angle the way they cover it i felt was very very smart um uh, because it just we'll try to keep this as spoiler free as we can guys um it basically starts out just kind of rumor, word of mouth, people seeing videos on YouTube and shit like that. And given the age that we live in here, it's pretty plausible, that actually, that that's the way it would begin. It would just kind of spread like a viral video, so to speak. Um, you know, people seeing incidents pop up in, you know, Georgia, then Texas, then Virginia, then Maine, and stuff like that. And somebody putting the piece together, like, you know, I'm starting to see a pattern here, you know, something definitely is up. Uh, to be perfectly honest, the first hour is a very slow burn. Um, it takes a little while for this show to get going, which I kind of knew it would. I didn't them expect you to just kick you in the pool on this one. I figured there, there's going to be a lot of setup, but there is going to be a payoff. Um, it's a 90-minute pilot. The last 30 minutes, they kick things up to a different gear, and things start moving along a little bit more. Um, I'm, I'm trying to give you guys as much information as I can without giving you spoilers, but... Um, I mean, shit, you don't even really see your first zombie until it's at least an hour in, right? Really? It's right at the end. So I'd say probably an hour and 20 minutes in. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really close to that. Well, the yeah, I guess maybe hour 15 it's, or so. It's but yeah, it's not right. the first hour. I mean, like, well, I mean, you do see one at the very beginning, very briefly. But, I mean, as far as for more than a 10-second kind of little, ah, you know, jump scare kind of thing. You know where it really sinks in it, it really takes a little while um, before you actually see what goes down and um, based upon the stuff that they showed you know at, at the end of the pilot of you know coming up this season on fear of the walking dead it definitely looks like things are going to get moving pretty quickly like this thing is going to get out of hand really fast probably within the first three or four episodes like the shit's going to hit the fan um, which is yeah, you know, really how something like that would work. And, I mean, we all know how this is going to end, boys and girls. I mean, it's going to end with the world that Rick Grimes wakes up in, where everything has gone to shit. So we know that, you know, the, the armed forces and whatnot, you know, mounting uh, the offense against this thing are going to lose. You know, I mean, that's that's the only logical outcome since this takes place in the same world as Rick Grimes, just different coast. But overall... um. Was it perfect? No, um, because you got big shoes to fill. I mean, The Walking Dead pilot, one of the best pilots in history, you know, where they just crushed it, you know, from the very beginning. Um, this is definitely its own animal, so if you're expecting a, basically a repeat of The Walking Dead, guys, you're going to be disappointed. It's it's not a repeat of The Walking Dead. It is its own television show following its own storyline with its own characters, and it's a very different animal. It still has that same flavor of The Walking Dead, where it's very obvious that things take place in that same universe. But at the same time, it's about the build-up. It's about the slow burn. We want to see a little bit of the story and how this thing actually comes about. But that is my two cents. Tyler, you watched it. What do you think, dude? I definitely think like the first hour was slow. Yeah. Um, 
slower than I think it had to be, but I mean, I can see them wanting to start off things slow because I think the rest of the season is going to be super fast paced. Yeah. Um, two quick things. My girlfriend was just like completely turned off from the beginning <laughs> of the show. She's like, "To hell with this! I'm not watching this till I see some zombies." So she, so I, I made her sit down and watch the rest of it, but she. Um, she was, I think, liking the very end of it when there was actually some action happening on the show um, without spoiling anything. Um, my second point is I I don't know what it is, but I do not like the son. I don't know. I don't either. There's something weird and about it, him. He's, he's being it's, compared it's, to a young Johnny Depp and shit. I'm like... He looks, okay. and and my girlfriend pointed it out, and there's a certain scene where he like looks over, he looks exactly like Johnny Depp in that scene, and she said it, and I was thinking it, I was like right about to say it, mm-hmm. and she said it first, and I heard somebody else t- say that today, okay. um, but I mean, regardless if if he looks like Johnny Depp, it's not that, it's just his acting, I mean, he's just... I mean, he plays a drug addict, and I don't think I'm giving away any huge spoilers here, but I just, I see this, like, so many episodes, like, centered around his addiction, when the outbreak happens, and how he's going to slow the group down, or he's going to find some drugs, or he's going to start, (laughs) you know, his... Uh, DTs coming off. Tyler's got all this shit figured out already, man. Holy shit. and and... (laughs) Like, I mean, we've already seen some of that in Walking Dead, like, with um, the dude. I guess it was in season three. The alcoholic. Uh, the alcoholic guy. And, I mean, it's it's just, like, it's just something else. Like, they took out one thing and they replaced it with another thing. And, to me, that's his character. Um, I think it's eventually, you know, going to catch up with him. But, I don't know, just something about it and some of the way he's acting, like, he... He walks around like Kramer throughout. Like he kind of does, actually. Steps. I didn't think about that. Yeah, and like I don't know, just something about it, yeah. the, the acting or something. I don't know. That kind of turned me off. But hopefully, you know, we'll we'll see some changes in the characters and stuff I later in the season. But like, I like the mom. I like the dad. Um, we don't really know too much about the daughter. Right. Um, I'm assuming that's just going to be the core. You know, initially. And then we'll have more people, you know, to join the group later on in the series. But sure. looks like it, you know, they did a preview, like Jimbo was saying, of the rest of the season. And it definitely looks like it's, like, ratcheted up the rest of the season. So, I think so. Um, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna so the outbreak really out. starts. Yeah. Are you, are you, can you, will you go on record and say you're definitely in, you want to see how it turns out? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm a huge fan of The Walking Dead, so, I mean, unless they do something just, like, crazy, you know, to throw me off, I'm in for it. Um, one thing that I wish they would have done was show this maybe during the summer when TV was so slow. Yeah. So, and they're going to be running, basically, both series side by side, and I hope it, people don't get fatigued from it, you know, and that's kind of what I was afraid of happening when you know when you have two of the same property running right at one time like sometimes you get fatigue of a franchise you know no, i agree i didn't i didn't think of that you're right that should have so, been like a july kind of premiere like early july yeah. or something then they blast through it and we're done by august then we've got august and september to recover and then october we get the walking dead no you're right i, th- I think maybe it's, they'll wise up next year yeah, and I mean, you you spoke to that a little bit with Star Wars, you know. Yeah. We've been kind of rationed out with Star Wars. Yeah. And how are we going to handle it when we get a ton of Star Wars, you know? And We're going to get burnt out. Sometimes, like, oh, God, fuck Jedi's enough, you know. Sometimes just getting the you know right amount of, of a show maybe every yeah. couple of years or something is, is better than getting so much so fast. Agreed. And, and uh, speaking of Star Wars, this kind of segues into something real quick. Um, I saw the guy that directed Jurassic World, Colin Trevorrow, is going to be directing Episode Nine. I saw that. Yeah, good for so him, man, he did a good job with Jurassic World. So this is not surprising at all to me because unlike Josh Trank, he actually made the transition to big budget film and fucking <laughs> killed it. You know, he had like 
His his first big budget film is the biggest opening weekend ever. He fucking kicked the Avengers out of the top spot. Like you were right. talking about a textbook case of how to handle it. This this guy's definitely got what it takes. So they're like, yeah, uh, do you want to do Star Wars Nine? No, sure. <laughs> Why not? So I guess J.J. Abrams is doing one the first two, and yeah. then he's going to pass on the torch. Yep. I wonder what he's going to move on to. Yeah, I'm gonna be too busy for for episode nine. Let me let me pass that on to somebody else. It's it's of course I'm the, sure there's burnout, you know, from oh, I'm doing. Sure. It's gonna be two. something original. I mean, he's already done Star Trek twice. He'll have already done Star Wars twice. I mean, it's like okay, well, you've covered two of the biggest franchises in history. You know what's hey. next? I, I'm thinking something original, like maybe. His next quote unquote super eight, which I loved by the way. I thought that got a lot oh, yeah, of unnecessary hate. I thought it was oh, fucking great. But that's it. um hopefully something original. Like I like his original stuff the best. The I love he how he does his thing. How he teases his movies. I know. Like he does the best tease. Like, like if you ever old, have seen the trailer. Thing. Yeah, which, clever. Which film. Technically wasn't his movie, but you know, right. he's one of the people involved. That is one of the best teasers ever, because you're just like what, what the, the fuck is this? Right. Like, is this Godzilla? You know that. And was I love how they tease that all throughout the the movie. That's one of the reasons I love Cloverfield. And either you love Cloverfield or you hate Cloverfield. And I'm definitely in the love. I'm in the love camp. camp. But um, the trailer for Super Eight, the tease for it. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. Where the train car was on the side and that something was like pounding against the door. Yep. And you're like, what in the hell is you know is this movie Super Eight about? But I, I, I just love how he teases movies. That's uh, um, one of the great things I love about J.J. Abrams. Agreed. Um, and that's you know aside from some of my favorite TV franchises, Lost, mm-hmm. Alias, Alias was great. Yeah, he's been involved uh, in quite a bit. Fringe. Yep. I mean, he's he's been around a lot of media. To say the very least, he's like, I mean, early on, and people were just like, he's the next Steven Spielberg. I think he's living up to that. Oh yeah, I really do. Like he's. I mean, if he if he's not Star Wars and Star Trek out of the park, he can just pick and choose from then on. I mean, oh sure. He's he's got a pretty good track record, man. He hasn't really had any duds. Like when you look at his record compared to Spielberg's record, they're both pretty good. You know, as far as consistency. Sorry. And I want to say, like, he did a, uh interview with Stern uh, one time, and he was saying, like, when he was a kid, I guess he kind of grew up in the Hollywood culture, and he was, you know, kind of connected with people. But I want to say Spielberg, like, brought him in to, like, edit maybe some of his, like, old, like, home movies and stuff like that. So, I mean, yeah. he he definitely, like, already kind of had a foot in the door. And uh, he's been making some great stuff for a long time now. So, but um, well, that's all I have for movie and TV news. Do you have anything else? No, man. Let's move into game news. Let's do. All this. right. You want to start off with the the big story? Yes, I do. Okay. Let's do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna right. let you take it. I'm I'm taking I'm <clears throat> side driving on this one, dude. Go. We're talking about Konami, right? Well, of course. Okay. Well, there was a big splash in in the news world for video games this week when I believe GameSpot broke a story saying that there was basically like a paywall set up in Metal Gear Solid Five, uh, Phantom Pain, and I guess you have to pay to actually play certain parts of the multiplayer. And was it any other parts of the game, Jimbo? Do you know? I, I don't think so. Okay, but um, I'm pretty sure this was, was exclusive to multiplayer. That was the the big news uh, this week, and it caused like a pretty big stink in the the video game industry. But I saw here recently that Konami came back and like kind of slammed GameSpot and was basically like, "You got this completely wrong. Mm-hmm. There is no paywall in the game." Um, you know we usually don't release news unless it's final or whatever. And um, basically said the GameSpot completely got it wrong. There's no paywall set up in the game. Mm-hmm. And that they're, what microtransactions they do have just kind of 
accelerates, I guess, your leveling or whatnot, which they have that in a lot of games now. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's not anything out of the ordinary, but, um, you know, I I could see Konami doing that and then, like, doing a 180 yeah. once, once the news broke. But uh, what do you think about it? Um, honestly, man, like, with the way that Konami has been showing that they just don't give a fuck what people think, uh, people think, rather, respectively, um, I think if this were real, that they'd be defending it, that they wouldn't be slamming it. I think that they're probably telling the truth when they're saying, like, this is bullshit. Um, just because their their behavior as of late has just shown that they don't care about pissing people off very much, so it's like, why would they stop at this? You know, on a game that's not even selling really well to begin with, so it's like, who cares? You know, so right. what? Um, but to Konami's credit, um, since we're on this particular topic, uh, the survey that they put out recently where they were basically asking uh, what people think of their legacy franchises, so things like Contra, Castlevania, Gradius, you know, all of those all those heavy hitters. Um, I think they're a little bit late on that, but I do still think it's a step in the right direction that they are doing that, that they're at least asking, like, hey, what do you think about this? And they're giving their fans a chance to voice their opinion. Um, I filled out the survey uh, as an FYI, folks. Uh, I picked uh, Contra Castlevania, uh, Gradius, Sunset Riders, and I know there's another one, uh, Bomberman. Uh, that's I think that's about it for me. And as far as, like, you know, they give you a little space to talk about why um, you want to bring these respective franchises back. I was very, very curt and very, very candid uh, with my reasonings. I'm like, you know, Bomberman is one of the best-selling game franchises in history. It's been going for over 30 years. Why wouldn't you use that? You know, it's the perfect platform for mobile devices, but you can also do it for, for consoles. Contra, why aren't you letting Mercury Steam do that? You know, they volunteered to do that when you let them do... Um, the new Castlevania game because I remember reading with them in an interview what other Konami franchise would you guys like to do and like well we'd like to take a crack at Contra I'm like fucking brilliant man let these guys do it (laughs) you know they want to do it and it's already in house give them the keys to the kingdom man let them go crazy they did a kick ass job with Castlevania I mean why not let them bring back you know Konami's original big gun you know the, the Contra franchise why wouldn't you do anything with that I mean Tyler tell me if I'm alone on this man if you saw a brand new Contra game especially not a downloadable only one. I'm talking about a fucking disc release for the console. How quickly would you buy that? Oh yeah, I'd definitely buy that. Uh, that'd be day one purchase for me. Like I'm not going to work. I'm staying at home playing fucking Contra. I mean, like I've been waiting for that forever. I mean, the same could be said with Bomberman. I'd love a new Gradius game. I would absolutely love a new Sunset Riders game. I mean, it's it's like they're sitting on gold and. Our generation, we're all grown up now, we've all got jobs, we all make a considerable income, and we like doing this shit. It's like the most common hobby in the world. Video gaming is becoming America's pastime. It's eventually going to surpass sports for the most common hobby. That's my prediction, folks. It just seems ludicrous that they're not doing anything with this. I think they're literally losing money holding still. So, back to the subject, do I think Konami did anything wrong in this? I honestly don't think they did. I honestly think GameSpot got this wrong. And... Konami was just like, no, no, we didn't do that. We may have screwed up everything else lately, but we didn't screw this up. So that's just my two cents. Well, Jimbo, I just actually intercepted one of Konami's um, internal memos. I just sent it to you via Facebook. Do you have Facebook pulled up? I can if you need me to. Oh, yeah. You need to look at this. What am I going to look at? Am I wrong? I I sent it to you. It's a picture. I sent it to you through the messenger. So definitely check Am I dead wrong? Oh, man, you've got to look at their planning for 2015. Okay, let me take a look here. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, in terms of zone, let's see. Fuck Hideo Kojima, fuck Metal Gear, fuck Silent Hill, fuck it, and fuck you. Update. Uh, fuck yeah. GameSpot on oh, the fuck fuck you. <laughs> that. GameSpot, I'm sorry, not GameStop. That might be accurate. Like, I honestly <laughs> hope Ty was wrong about this, but based upon their behavior so far, uh, maybe... <laughs> Get it together, Konami. Just yeah, and I it. mean, we know Metal Gear Solid's like one of their best-selling franchises, sure, sure. but I mean, they've got so many properties that they could, you know, definitely bring to market and make, you know, uh, legitimate money on and bring some of that stuff out. I think they had a great thing with the um, PT 
Uh, I think that would have been a a great game. It was freaky as hell from what I saw. And I've watched, I haven't played it myself, but I've seen a lot of um, gameplay footage of it. And, you know, just going through the house multiple times and just seeing different stuff, you know, out of place. Like, that game was freaky. I think that was a great idea that they had, and they just dropped it. And getting rid of um, Kojima and, you know, who would have thought the Metal Gear a, stuff, a, a yeah. demo to a game would become a collector's item? Because now all the the PS4s uh, with that on the hard drive are now like they're asking prices like a thousand dollars for these things. See, I thought that that um, I thought that they I, I could have swore I read an article that said that when they discontinued the being able to download PT. Mm-hmm. I thought they were going to actually disable it on people's hard drives, but I guess they aren't able to do that. I don't think they can. I think it's okay. because it's on the hard drive. That's it. Like you're, so the ones well, that have it good. right now are the only people that will ever have it, which that's is like the up. definition of a collector's item. But, dude, yeah, somebody is going to hack it. Somebody's going to put it out. That's what always happens. So, ladies and gentlemen, fear not. Within a couple of years, someone will figure out how to crack this shit. They always do. So All right, and... That. Moving on to another hot button topic yes, for this past week, I want to talk about this big Patreon yeah. debate that that we're having in the video game community. Yeah, yeah. This and, this, this affects Tyler and I both at a personal and a professional level here. I'm, you know, right now I'm I don't have a Patreon or whatever. But if one day Me I wanted either. to create one, you know, I wish I I, I want to do it and. You know, I probably won't ever make a video or anything. Uh, I think I'll just have a button up there on my page, you know, if I ever do it. But, you know, I've seen so many people go apeshit about this Patreon on when somebody opens a Patreon. And um, recently I saw one on um, Pete Doerr's channel. Yes. And Pete Doerr has put out hundreds of videos you know, for the for his love of video games, um, and has done probably hundreds of hours of their podcast because I know they're up in the hundreds of um, in the episodes mm-hmm. of all gen gamers, and all of that is is you know basically free. I mean, you can not basically um, free. It watch free. it, yeah. I mean, it, it's free. It's free, and he comes out with a video. Um, basically, you know, saying if you want to support my channel, you know, feel free to. If you don't want to donate money, you know, then continue to watch my videos, you know, for free, right. you know. But if you want to help or support the channel, you know, put it up there. Right. And um, I just saw so many people bashing him on Facebook. I mean, not on Facebook, but on, well, I guess there was I've some on Facebook. On cause, yeah. yeah. And then some on his YouTube channel, and he, you know, he even posted, you know, I know this isn't going to be popular with some of you. Some of you are against this or whatever. But I think you don't even have to say anything like that. Like if you want to support the channel, support the channel. And I, when I do create my Patreon, I'm going to support him and a few other of my favorite YouTube channels. But um, because of just all the entertainment I've gotten, you know, from his channel for free. And um, I'm just tired of seeing the hate. Like, if you don't want to support it, don't support it. I mean, that's that's all there is to it. You don't have sure. to bitch and call somebody an e-bagger right. or whatever. But, like, a lot of the stuff that we do on YouTube, like, you know, it costs money. Like, I, my computer died. Right. Um, I mean, it, it started running so slow I couldn't even edit videos or anything. I had to upgrade my computer. So I got a nicer computer and all that. You know, which I put on um, a payment plan or whatever. I, I mean, we'll, we'll get into personal stuff on this. So, you know, I put that in my camera and all that stuff so I could make new episodes on, you know, my Best Buy account. Gotcha. And, you know, nobody paid for that outright for me. Right. I don't expect anybody to pay for it for me. But, I mean, it costs money to make, you know, YouTube. Right. Shows. I mean, it takes computers to to record stuff. People bitch if they don't have, you know, good sound during right. episodes, and you know, so we have nice microphones and stuff like that, mm-hmm. you know, to make better content for people. And you know, 
not that they're sitting there asking for a handout. I mean, there's a way to do it, and there's a way not to do it. And right. I thought, you know, his was very, you know, basically the way, you know, anybody should, should do it. Just like, you know, if you want to support it, that's fine. If you don't, then that's fine. He's not putting a guilt trip on anybody. And, um, and I've seen that from so many other channels too. Right. Um, people that do it the right way and then people get pissed off because, you know, they call them e-baggers or whatever. Right. And I think it's a few people who have, done maybe campaigns and stuff on Kickstarter right. and got a ton of money. And I want to say maybe Angry Joe did this. And this is one thing that I see a lot um, in the comment section. And I don't know, you know, from – I've never I've, – I've watched maybe a couple of the guys' videos. But supposedly he did this big campaign on Kickstarter or something to um, basically do like a command center for his gaming channel, okay. like for computers and stuff, and he raised like fifty thousand dollars. Wow. Right. Holy and shit. I mean he probably didn't spend near about that much on um you know computers and whatnot. But the guy's got like over a million subscribers. Right. So whatever ad revenue he gets on his channel I'm sure would would you know cover all that. And that's a I think a situation where you know, he probably didn't have to do a Kickstarter. No, he wouldn't. You know, to raise money. And, you know, I think it's a couple of these bad apples that are giving everybody else, like, a bad name. And I can tell you, like, I've got over a thousand subscribers, and I don't get any money, you know, from ads or anything else. I, I've, I mean, I've, I've got some on my channel, but I've I've never even come close to like making any money. I don't get a check or anything else. I do this for the love of video games. Uh, the reason I started my channel and Pete Dora was a big reason I started my channel. I loved his videos. I loved Happy Console Gamers videos, and um, I wanted to talk about uh, franchises that that were important to me that I wasn't seeing videos made about. Right. I wanted you know, to to get the word out about those games, and um, you know I think that's the important part of this thing on YouTube is is getting our voice out there. But you know I think people are getting kind of lost in this whole Patreon debate. And like if you like a channel, you don't have to support it if you don't want to. But but don't bitch if you know somebody comes and's like basically you know I, I know Jimbo said this that you look at Patreon like a, a tip jar. Right. And, um, you know, I think that's that's what it is, is a, a tip jar. You know, if you like channels, help support it. And, um, you know, I know this podcast, it, every month just to host our um, podcast episodes, it's a monthly fee and all that, but we pay for it, you know, to give our listeners entertainment. We enjoy doing it first and foremost, you know. But um, I don't know. People just aren't looking at the big picture. I don't think on this. What, what's your view on this? Um, like you said, man. You know, uh, the analogy I gave with the tip jar—that's really the best way that I could explain uh, Patreon to anyone who doesn't know what it is. It's uh, guys. I work in the big bad city, our nation's capital, and I go across the street every morning to my favorite coffee shop. And I get the exact same cup of coffee every single time without fail, regardless of whether or not I put any money, a dime at all, in the tip jar. Um, it's the same service. It's the same smile. I'm not looked down upon, and I don't get any type of degradation of my service for not putting a dollar or 10 cents or 50 cents or whatever in the tip jar. That is really all that Patreon is. You are still getting the exact same crap that you were getting before on YouTube. Nothing is really special other than probably a mention and maybe some extra stuff on Facebook, um, at least so far, uh, to those people who contribute. And again, if you don't want to contribute, no one is forcing you to. This isn't e-begging. Like Tyler said, the stuff that we do costs money. The, the amount of money that I have thrown into YouTube is in the thousands. I'm not even close to coming to recoup that. It's going to be a very long time uh, before I actually recoup that as far as YouTube ad revenue. And I've got 10 times the number of subscribers that Tyler does, and even I'm not that close. So it's this whole thing of people 
you know, everyone who has even a decent following on YouTube of like getting rich on YouTube, guys, even if you got a hundred thousand subscribers, I would not be able to quit my full-time job. I wouldn't even be able to come close. You know, that would be, I'd have to seriously downgrade everything that I do just to use that as my formal source of income. So if you have any illusions that somebody even with a hundred K subs is getting like a hundred thousand dollars a year, you are fucking deluded. That is not the way YouTube works. And that's not the way it's ever going to work. I'm not in the foreseeable future, at least. Um, you know, of course the elephant in the room would be somebody like PewDiePie. Okay. Yeah. He made $7, $7 million last year. Okay. Not everyone can do that. Um, he's not just the biggest gaming channel on YouTube. He is the biggest channel period. So no one, not even AVGN is anywhere close to him as far as the people like the, the fan base that he touches. This guy is in a league of his own. So not even someone like angry Joe it's yeah. Does he have a million subscribers? Okay, great. He does. But is he going to become a millionaire based on YouTube? Uh, maybe someday, but I don't think he's quite there yet. I'm sure the guy's not hurting. And like Tyler said, he didn't need to to go to Kickstarter to raise uh, computer money. If he's got a million subscribers, he could shell out five or ten grand um, for a computer setup easily. You know, based upon his daily views. I'm just extrapolating what little I get up to that level. Oh, that would be no problem whatsoever. So it's just. Everyone seems to think that YouTube is so easy to do and it's so easy to be successful at. I hear this all the time, both on my channel, both on other people's channel, both on some of the Facebook groups uh, that Tyler and I are part of. Like, you know, it's so easy to do this. Uh, my answer to them is like, okay, asshole, you have a camera. Go out and do it. If you think it's so goddamn easy to do what we do, YouTube's free, man. No one's stopping you. Put up or shut the fuck up. That's, that's, my, that's what I say. Like, seriously. I want everyone to be on YouTube. I encourage my viewers, guys, start your own YouTube channel. But if you think it is at all easy to do this, then why aren't we all making millions of dollars like PewDiePie is? We're not. No one is even close to him, guys. And I'm sorry, like the number of YouTube millionaires out there is probably less than 10. So it's, this isn't easy. It's never going to be easy. Anyone can do it. But the statistical facts on this, guys, 99% of all YouTube videos get less than 100 views. So that's what you're up against. Just making it into the circles that Tyler and I have, we're already in that top 1%. And that's a big 1%, if you ask me. That's a very big spectrum of 1%. So stop hating on people simply because they have a Patron account or they have a Kickstarter or something like that. No one is forcing you to do anything. This whole recent generation of me, 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 everything has to be free, blah, 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 blah. The same people ripping music and shit for free. Like everything has to be free. Guys, your television service is not free. Your satellite service isn't free. Your internet service isn't free. Your cellular service isn't free. The people who work on television movies do not work for free. We're putting ourselves and our money and our time into this. Why do you think that we are below earning any type of salary for doing so? None of those other industries do. And guys, I have news for you. YouTube is going to eclipse television one day. That is a fucking guarantee for me right here. I will go on record and guarantee you that YouTube will become the dominant media broadcasting format. It is already quickly climbing that and eating into television's market share. Give it five to eight years at the most, man. YouTube people will be making television actor salaries, like on average. So it's just kind of a double standard, guys. You guys think that all these movie stars and all these TV stars should make a considerable salary. Okay. Well, if we're putting our hearts and souls into this too, and we're not asking to be paid millions of dollars, we're, you know, I guess most of us at most are asking just to break even to give you guys good content. Why are we being made the bad guys for that? And for the record, I'm like Tyler. I don't have a Patron account, guys. Am I against it? No. You know, for a guy who's putting out quality content, top flight shit with good quality editing, sound camera, guys, all this stuff costs money. You know, YouTube doesn't run on air. We all have personal jobs. We all have to take time out of our lives to do this. And don't get me wrong, I enjoy doing it. It's, it's a hobby and it's a passion of mine. But guys, because it's a hobby and a passion doesn't mean it isn't work. A guy in his garage who's putting together and restoring a car, is that a hobby and a passion? And he's basically doing it for free for himself? Yes. Does that mean it's not hard work? No, it's very hard work. Hard work equals money. That's just the way things work. It either costs money that you have to spend or you get paid money or hopefully both. So stop alienating yeah. people, guys. That's all we're saying. You know, and, and something to, to kind of add to the end of that is, 
you know, there's certain channels out there. I know um, Happy Console Gamer yeah. um, did one of those um, Patreon accounts, yeah. and he's another person I'll support uh, when I finally do make my account. But, um, you know, I used to look forward to his videos every Sunday. It normally puts up one one a week or whatever. And ever since he started a Patreon account and, you know, people started supporting it where I guess he could probably afford to maybe work a little less or whatnot. But, I mean, now we're getting two or three videos a week, and I love that. And some of my favorite channels, you know, that can only put up one video a week, right. You know, some of that stuff might allow them to where they can kind of make that a full time job and, and provide more video content that, that you love and Absolutely. and that's the beauty of that to me is is that you can um you know, turn it into a form of income for the people to where they can make more content for their channels and um you know, I I go through uh, a lot of periods during the week where um, you know, I don't have much to watch just because a lot of the channels I'm subscribed to you know, aren't putting out a whole lot of content. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know for me it takes several hours to edit, you know, just one video. And, um, oh, at least. you know, so, I mean, I'm not able to put out as many episodes as I'd like to. Agreed. But um, kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, I'm subscribed to another channel. And I'd, I'm not calling the guy out or anything, but um, I love his his YouTube channel. And it's Aaron Kosharski. He does this show called Video Game Wizard. Right. And he basically like runs a um, flea market uh, booth, and he has a video game store. Right. And um, well, they're not particularly like well-edited videos and all that, but they're interesting. You know, he kind of has a story. And I think that would be neat to kind of run a video game store, but... Uh, he, last week or whatever, this guy started a GoFundMe account because he said his mom's, you know, store was going to close down. And um, he's kind of said, like, in his comment section that, you know, his mom doesn't, um, they're not good with money and stuff like that. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons that their store is going to shut down. And, I mean, to... And that's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum from Patreon is like when you start like trying to have people, you know, from YouTube to fund your um, things that aren't going to work or, or, you know, trying to like that's to me something that has nothing to do with your show. You know, you're trying to save somebody's store that's not even on your show or whatever. And um, people have tried to give them advice on, you know, how to help his mom's um, store and whatnot and, you know, starting a GoFundMe account to save a video game store that sounds like it was doomed from the start, you know. Right. Isn't a good way to, you know, fundraise money or whatever. So um, that's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, like that and the Angry Joe. Right. And, you know, I think the other channels, I think they're doing it right. So, I mean, you have to make your own determination on that, uh, you know, and I think that it's definitely okay to do it, um, to, you know, have a Patreon account. But, you know, uh, just for people out there that, that that pisses off to actually have a Patreon account, you know, either just support it or don't and, right. and just be done with it. Agreed. But uh, let's, we're getting kind of short on time now. So uh, let's, do you want to go into viewer questions? Yeah. Let's do that. We got some good ones. Um, yeah, we got a lot of good ones. Uh, we have first question from, uh, dude, I am not even freaking sure how to pronounce your name, but I'll take a stab at it. Uh, Kenny Hatanaron, stand up, asks something you guys wow. probably <laughs> yeah I, I don't know something you guys have probably talked about, but how well do you think Zombie will do on the uh, PS4 and Xbox One after being ported two years <laughs> after it's been on the Wii U? Very good question. Thank you very much for submitting it. Um, uh, I for one was really kind of shocked when I heard that this was going to be ported to next-gen systems. I was like, dude, that game came out like two years ago. Like, that's isn't this kind of late? And at the same time, if you're taking the gamepad out of it, guys, for me, that kind of kills part of the game because that's one of the very few games on the Wii U that made logical use of the gamepad. Like, it, where, where it really became its own dimension inside the game. Um, would it be cool to see it on next-gen hardware, you know, with, you know, the gloves off and higher frame rate and better res and all that shit? Sure. You know, I'm very curious to see what it looked like. It looked, I thought, fantastic 
on the Wii U. It was definitely some of the best visuals on this system um, as far as the character models and stuff, but I honestly don't think it's going to sell all that well. Um, I think we're kind of past the height of the zombie game franchise craze, so I, I don't think it's going to do particularly well. I'm sure they'll probably make their money back, but I think the, the ship has kind of been sailed on that one. I'm, I'm kind of with you on that, and I think that the use of the tablet in Zombie U was just so... It was so good. I mean, using the tablet to snipe, using it for your inventory yeah. and all that, I mean, I just thought it was so neat how it was used, and I don't know how they're going to translate that. I guess there just won't be any of that aspect in the next-gen you know, systems. But, I mean, I guess it's good if you don't have a Wii U and you want to play the game. Yeah. Um, you know, it'll be nice in that aspect that you'll actually, you know, be able to purchase it. But if you want a more immersive experience, definitely get it on the Wii U. I agree. Uh, next question comes from my good friend and lifer subscriber over on my channel, 13666 13 Matt. Yeah, he asked a very good question that I think is very related to the episode that we're doing. That would be, uh, he asked what our favorite horror movie series, favorite horror movie serial killer, and, uh, or excuse me, just favorite horror movie killer and favorite uh, survival horror video game. Um, mine, as far as the movie series, I'm going to go a little bit off the beaten path here and not pick one of the slasher franchises, but my series of movies that I think is probably my go-to, which would be the Romero zombie films. Um, I absolutely love those. So night, dawn, and day, basically. And you could include Land of the Dead and Survival of the Dead. I think those are definitely worthy ent entries. Um, simply because... Each one of them was made in a completely different decade. Um, it was 60s, 70s, and 80s. There was supposed to be one in the 90s. Oh, and um, Diary of the Dead. I forgot that one. Um, so each of them is kind of speaking to a societal norm, uh, whether it be malls or um, discrimination or consumerism or the obsession with the Internet, you know, just all this other stuff. And each of them has kind of their own little undertone that it speaks to. Um uh, favorite uh, horror movie killer, dude, Jason Voorhees, no contest. I mean, he's he's got the all-time body count, so it's, no, like, the kill scenes in that, top-notch. Um, my favorite uh, survival horror video game, um, I'm going to have to go as a tie uh, between the original Silent Hill and Resident Evil 2. I would put those in a dead heat because they're very different. One is shock, and the other is atmosphere. And I think both of them uh, hit very strong notes in their respective genres. But, uh, Tyler, what's your answer, sir? All right, my favorite movie series would be Nightmare on Elm Street. Something about Freddy always just creeped me the hell out. So <laughs> um, that's my favorite series. My favorite um, killer in the in movies, I would say, would be Pennywise the Clown. And, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Never have liked clowns ever since. So that's, wow. Didn't see yeah. that one coming. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that's kind of out left field, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. They all float down here. <laughs> oh, God. Jesus. <laughs> Creepy motherfucker. Um, and my favorite video game, um, you've already heard it earlier in the podcast, The Last of Us. Nice. Definitely my favorite series. So, um, Very nice. Good question there. Yeah, that was a good question, Matt. Thank you for that. And our final question from Jorge Andres Sandoval ha, 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 would be, uh, Corey, this is on Facebook, Corey and yours comments uh, up top bring up a good question. I'm not sure which one he was talking about, but uh, who is most likely to take over Capcom now that the shareholders have voted to end the takeover defense? Sony, Microsoft, or Nintendo? Um, Jorge, I actually had not heard that, um, that they had uh, voted uh, against the takeover defense. I mean, it's certainly not impossible, but... Um, given what uh, Capcom, what I just did read, what they're lining up for Tokyo Game Show, and they're literally bringing the big guns, you know, Street Fighter and uh, Resident Evil uh, Zero Remake, Resident Evil 2 Remake, like, they're they're really swinging for this thing, like, guys, don't forget about us, We're, we want to make it right with you guys, at least so it seems. Um, I'm not really sure that they have a, a, big, a big fear of takeover at this point, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but... I, I, I'll tell you what, we will answer your question in theory, uh, based upon, in a theoretical world, could this happen if somebody bought them out, who would buy them out? Um, I think the most likely candidate would be Nintendo, personally, uh, because A, they definitely have the money, you don't have to worry about that, Nintendo has stacks of cash, 
I figure, I, I picture Reggie fills and me just like doing the fucking Scrooge McDuck shit, like just diving into his stacks <laughs> of hundred dollar bills because diving into gold would actually kill you. Duck Tales is bullshit, everyone. So, uh, Nintendo, I would say, would be a really good fit to take it over, mainly because then we would get, we could have Street Fighter characters in Super Smash Brothers. I mean, we've already gotten Mega Man, a little taste of it here and there. Um, we could see just all these cool incorporations of Capcom and Nintendo franchises. Like, we could see, like, uh, like Mega Man and Mario in the same game or something like that. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. But I think that would be a really cool marriage because a lot of the stuff that Capcom is known for, Nintendo is really good at handling. And Nintendo could really use a boost in the adult department, meaning the Street Fighters, the Resident Evils, and stuff like that. They don't really have anything for that particular segment of gaming. All of their stuff is a play by adults, yes, but it can also be played by kids. And to survive in this industry, guys, you got to really appease both. Um, because Tyra and I would be the prime example. We're both grown ups, obviously. You know, we can do whatever the hell we want, even on a school night. And <laughs> we like playing Nintendo games. Tyra's a Metroid fan. I'm obviously a Mario fan. And we also like playing the grown up games, you know, like survival horror games. So it'd be kind of boring if we were playing all one and not the other, don't you think? I, yeah, I think so. It'd get kind of dull, so it's kind of nice to be able to change it up. So, I think Nintendo would do right by it, and they would treat it correctly. I think that they would be the correct fit uh, for Capcom. But what I really want them to do is buy Hudson Soft. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think either Sony or Microsoft. I think Sony right now would be the the best fit, just because you know they've basically signed a partnership with them for Street Fighter. Um, I think Microsoft probably would love to buy Capcom. Oh, I'm sure they would. Just because they've shut down all their first-party development, they like to buy um, developers, you know, to have as their in-house, uh, you know, franchises and stuff. But uh, you know, think all the properties they would get would just if they bought that out. And they have, they've bought Rare, you know, they bought all kinds of you know franchises to uh, not franchises, but. Uh, development studios so um I, I think they have a history of it i think either of those companies probably would be a good fit I think so, so we had two pretty different answers on that one we did but that's the whole point of this podcast you know we're not sitting here that's right ourselves you know we're trying we don't to be dynamic. we don't sit here and slap each other on the back and say good oh, job fuck no no i mean you can't <laughs> you can't listen to pat and ian all the time you know and they don't agree on everything and tyler and i don't agree on everything so it's that's all right. good but uh, Jorge Andres Sandoval, ah, ha, ha, do the dance. Thank you very much for the... I can't look at that and not think like salsa or something. <laughs> I think that's awesome. If I had a name like that, I'd be like salsa instructor. It'd be awesome. Nice. But uh, thank you very much for the question. And to everyone else who asked a question, thank you very much. And if you want to submit one, guys, you can do it on several platforms. You can do it on either of the YouTube videos that we're putting this up. You can do it on the Facebook page, which we would, which would be the Nerd Bucket. Um, you can hit uh, Tyler's page up on Facebook. You can hit my page up. Mine's called Retro Game Lounge, formerly called the Jimbo Channel. And, you know, guys, just ask us a question. We love questions. If nothing else, you're enabling us to be lazy. You're giving us topics that we don't have to research, and we can simply think about and answer your questions. So if there's anything burning on your noggin you want to hear us address, you want to hear us answer, send us a question. You guys are awesome. We love you guys, all of you. And if you want a little more zombie goodness, um, I actually posted my top 10. So I actually took it all the way out to 10. Uh, you've got my top five. So if you want to hear the other five, check out Metroid's Prime on YouTube and get the other five. Right on, dude. Well, I think that about wraps up this particular episode of the Nerd Bucket Podcast. Unless you have anything else, I am completely out of ammunition. I think I am too, buddy. So hopefully we can hunker down for the zombie apocalypse and make it till next week's podcast. <laughs> Guess we'll see. <laughs> well, without further ado, thank you everyone so much for listening and or watching to this episode of the nerd bucket. I and I will be back next week and get out there and play some games or something. You know, don't listen to us all the time. Go game. Duh. That's right. See you later, everyone. Later guys.